It's not on, just a minute. On. The green light has to be on. Please. Good afternoon. I'm John Stauffer. I'm uh, very excited and happy to uh, be co-teaching American Democracy uh, with Roberto Unger. Today we're going to have a conversation and we welcome you to participate in terms of uh, an overview of the course uh, and the main themes. Uh, and uh, before we start, does, does anyone have any questions about the syllabus, about the readings, about the assignments? Uh, we tried to spell out pretty carefully in, de in detail what the expectations are both for undergraduates and graduate students. Don't be shy. Okay. So uh, this is, I should say, the first time I've been co-teaching with uh, Roberto. It's a course that he's taught in the past. Uh, I, it's a subject that I, is very um, dear to my heart, the concept of American uh, democracy. And uh, we are going to begin by just um, begin with uh, let me just summarize the various uh, weeks. Um, the part one is the American distinction, the salvageable remnant of American exceptionalism. So one of the overarching themes is the concept of American exceptionalism. Another overarching theme is uh, the inequalities uh, within a democracy. Another theme is uh, the, um, the, the multiracial makeup of the United States uh, of North America from its founding. And uh, we would like to begin just a conversation between Roberto and myself uh, on uh, American exceptionalism. So I would also make a few remarks about the course in general. So this is a course which intends to imagine the United States, the American national experience and what distinguishes it, uh, and to imagine it both with respect to institutions, the practical organization of society through its political and economic arrangements, but also to imagine it with respect to consciousness the self-understanding of Americans, how they conceive of their national experiment. Now, one might think that the study of a particular country, in this case the United States, is an invitation to apply the established disciplines, uh, economics, political science, uh, the study of culture, and so forth. But there is a problem. 
And this problem is actually one of the reasons to try to do what we're trying to do here, which is that you, you cannot successfully evoke the national experience simply by applying or juxtaposing the established disciplines. The established disciplines turn out to be unable to converge to such an understanding. So the experience, the intellectual experience, is an experience which more resembles the subversion of the established disciplines than their application. And that is one of the reasons to do this. So a young American today at a place like Harvard University who wants to study the United States, who wants to do what I'm proposing as the subject of this course, will have trouble. It's not obvious how he should proceed other than by having a collection of courses in American history or sociology or economics. Uh, and the addition, the synthetic activity of imagining the whole is delegated to him. Uh, and the, the science, the specialized disciplines don't do that for him. So this is the difficulty which makes a task like the one that we propose here both difficult and interesting. Now, there's a second thing to say, which is that in this course, the, the study of the American experiment historically is related to an attempt to imagine the alternative futures of the United States. Uh, and there is a reciprocal, a dialectical relation between these two things. To understand something is to have insight into its transformative possibilities. If we don't understand what it can become next, we, don't under, we, we have no insight into what it is now. Uh, and so the attempt to understand the United States historically will be intimately related in our conversations to the attempt to imagine its transformative possibilities in the future. Not the remote speculative future, but the next steps, what it can next become. Uh, so John, I wonder whether you'd like to comment something on s about some feature of those remarks. Yes, yeah, so I would just add to that, which I very much like those Marx remarks, the notion that um, un Coming to terms with America also means um, exploring the past and how one understands and interprets the past profoundly shapes the way they see the present and imagine a future. Of course. Uh, and, and, and now, for myself and my position is, I firmly think that we shouldn't study American history as if it were simply an extended prelude to the civil rights movement and to identity politics. Yes, yes. We should have another sense. It should be something that makes the natural strange. Uh, it should awaken us to possibilities that are denied. Yes. And, and really engaging with the past is, is echo, uh, it's a way of echoing what you mentioned earlier is that one cannot, one, if one approaches the past or the present for that matter, especially in the United States from one disciplinary perspective, uh, it's a very flawed and faulty perspective. It gives a very s a small slice of what this um, nation is. Yeah. So uh, 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 a manifestation of this difficulty is if you try to imagine general works about the United States that would accomplish what we've said we want to do here, it's very difficult. So one of them, Tocqueville's Democracy in America, was written by a Frenchman, a foreigner, uh, uh, in the early life of the Republic. Then there's uh, 
uh, say, Henry Adams' uh, yeah. history of the United States in the, in the early presidency. So romantic historiography, the historiography of the romantic movement, had this capacious, organic vision. But ever since, there has been no adequate methodological representation of this ambition. So that puts us, in a sense, at a loss right. in the attempt right. to set out a disinquiry. So I say all of that simply in the spirit to, of, of emphasizing that it's not obvious how we should go about this, and that any procedure that we might embrace will be inherently controversial. Right. And unfinished. And unfinished, of course, always, <laughs> as life is. So uh, yes. in these great contemporary democracies, yes. the most important attribute is vitality. Yeah. And I would say we're about to begin the discussion of American exceptionalism. The most important attribute of the United States is its vitality. Yes. And uh, Hermelin, the German poet, said, he who thinks most deeply loves what is most alive. That is the most adorable characteristic of these contemporary societies, their vitality, because from vitality comes the possibility of transcending structure. And that is the emotional and moral perspective from which, at least speaking for myself, I hope to embark on this inquiry. Now, on the theme, on the initial theme set for today, American exceptionalism, let me begin that discussion by offering a set of remarks. And I'm going to stop along the way and ask John to comment. And then afterwards, we're going to open it to discussion among all of us. So the idea of American exceptionalism is the United States is different from all the other countries in the world. Now, in a trivial sense, every society, every country is different from every other country. But the strong idea of American exceptionalism is that the United States, the American Republic, has been a society that has escaped the downward cycles of history and is able then to show the way to the rest of humanity. So one version of this idea is that the Americans discovered early in the history of their republic the basic formula of a free society, politically free and economically free. And they then disseminate this formula throughout the world. The rest, it is in the interest of the rest of humanity to subscribe to this formula, lest it continue to vegetate in poverty and despotism. This is the strongest and most controversial version of the idea of American exceptionalism. America brings light to the rest of humanity. Uh, and this idea has not just been an an impotent doctrine. It has been carried also by force of arms. So it is related to what have been the two fundamental principles of American foreign policy, I would say. From very early in the history of the Republic, even before the United States emerged as a world power. So the first principle is that the United States will enjoy undisputed hegemony in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's part of the world. And the, the doctrines that formulated that in foreign policy were the Monroe Doctrine, formulated very early in the history of the United States, mm -hmm. and later on the Roosevelt Corollary, mm -hmm. uh, formulated during the administration of Theodore Roosevelt, of Teddy Roosevelt. The second principle uh, animating American foreign policy throughout has been that the United States will work to prevent any other power in some other part of the world 
from establishing in that part of the world a regional hegemony that is so absolute that on that basis it can then bid for world hegemony. That's the second principle. These are the two basic principles, I would say, of American foreign policy. And they have been, in a sense, a practical interpretation of the implications of American exceptionalism. Would you like to comment while I'm at that? Part of uh, that policy stemmed from slavery. So the, you're right that the United States has, um, has sought to um, has sought to prohibit or exclude it and to uh, create a boundary of, of, uh, from which another country should not penetrate. It's why they aggressively sought to either invade or purchase land that occupied North America. From the beginning, the United States was interested in the continent and from the, from the uh, interested in the continent. So Native Americans um, were forced out from the beginning. Um, the, as you pointed out, the Monroe Doctrine, the Louisiana Purchase transforms the United States in terms of um, uh, opening up um, huge swaths of the country and it uh, propels the rise of slavery. And then the Mexican War which uh, does the same thing where statesmen made up excuses in a sense to make war on Mexico so that they could, so that policymakers and politicians could uh, create a nation that occupied the continent. So given that just a preliminary introduction, uh, I want to propose a certain take on the idea of American exceptionalism. And the take, is, the take is to ask, what can we make of this idea? Uh, what is the salvageable residue of this somewhat mystical idea and obviously invidious notion that one country stands above all the others and leads the way? Uh, or to use Marx's phrase, what is the rational kernel in the mystical shell of the idea of American exceptionalism? And one way of approaching that is to say that the United States represents on, in many dimensions or many spectrums an extreme of characteristics that are common among the advanced societies especially what are now the rich countries of the North Atlantic world. Uh, and that gives an empirical sense to this otherwise invidious and somewhat mystical idea of American exceptionalism. The United States is different, but it is different in a way that does not necessarily flatter this canonical conception of American exceptionalism. So let's begin with, with then the first characteristic, which is the extent to which the United States denies that it is a class society. All contemporary societies are class societies. They are societies in which the life chances of individuals are powerfully shaped by the hereditary transmission of differential economic and educational advantage through the family. And the result is the shaping of society in the form of distinct classes that have not only different degrees of access to wealth and income, but different forms of consciousness, different ways of life. So it's not a simple continuum of economic advantage and disadvantage. It's the segregation of society into different groups that have different experiences of life 
and of its possibilities. Now, it has been traditional in the United States, although not u universal, to deny that the United States is a class society. In one of the writings that are on the syllabus, in a little book that I wrote with Cornell West, I cite Herbert Hoover's speech in <coughs> accepting the nomination to, to, to run again for the presidency of the United States, in an election in which he was defeated, as you know, by Franklin Roosevelt. And in this speech given in Madison Square Garden, Herbert Hoover says, we're not like the class societies of Europe. We're not a class society like all the European societies are. In our country, the individual rises and falls in a fluid medium. Uh, that's, the, that's the conception. Huh? But the truth seems to be, in a sense, the exact opposite. That is, not only has the United States been a class society, but it has been, for most of the time, in most circumstances, a class society with very powerful restraints on social mobility. Mm -hmm. There have been two great episodes of mass social mobility in American history. By one episode, the children of farmers or farmhands became industrial workers. And by the second episode, the children of industrial workers became white collar workers working in offices. Uh, and by that transformation, the second of these two transformations, comes the characteristic American idea of the middle class, which is supposedly most of the country. Now, what does it mean to be middle class? And now I want to propose a, a polemical interpretation. I would say to be a middle class person in the United States means to be a worker with a bourgeois identity. And that's the meaning of the term middle class. So uh, in fact, there has been a very standard class structure in the United States similar to the class structure of all the advanced Western societies. At the top of this class structure, there is a professional business class. And at the very top of that professional business class, a plutocratic elite, which has dis disproportionately benefited from the recent transformations of the economy. Then under the professional business class, there is a small business class what in the European vocabulary would be called a petty bourgeoisie. Of, uh, the, the, the basic ideal of which, by default, remains independent family business based on self-exploitation and family saving financially. Then under the small business class, there is a working class with a white collar and a blue collar segment. And then under the working class, there is an underclass of workers working in the unstable secondary part of the labor market, a large part of which is racially stigmatized. So that's the basic class structure of the United States. And it's paradoxical that the very existence of this class structure should be denied, as it is, by Americans in general. Now, you could say the denial of the reality of class has, paradoxically, certain advantages. It has the great disadvantage of impeding an attack on the class structure, of impeding any attempt to explore the contradictions between democracy and class society. But it does have an advantage, one could say, which is that it, in a sense, encourages cooperation of, of, of people of the different classes, for example, in war. And the ability for cross-class cooperation has been a significant advantage. Now, that last remark, in turn, leads me to, to recall 
that a huge complication of the class structure in the United States is, of course, the racial divisions. And a major theme in our conversations throughout the semester is how we should correctly understand the relation between race and class. So the existence of these cross-cutting racial divisions uh, is one of the obstacles to the accurate recognition of the realities of class. And that was true from the beginning. So the settlement of North America by Europeans uh, and Africans, the, the early, in the colonial period, there were the number of free people was at a small minority. The m majority of people who settled were either indentured servants or enslaved people. Uh, and there was a period, many of you know this, th in which indentured servants and enslaved, they recognized a kind of kindred spirit because both were unfree. Indentured servants had no freedom, no freedom of mobility, no, they were, they were essentially enslaved to a master. The difference between servitude, indentured servitude, and slavery is the former was for a 10-year period, the latter was for life. And Bacon's rebellion was a rebellion that brought, that united blacks and indentured servants, and the master class recognized the potential power that that held and uh, effectively divided them. Uh, and the indentured servants, the children and grandchildren of indentured servants uh, in their quest to rise and uh, develop themselves uh, became, started to define themselves as white and free, uh, meaning that the racial structure becomes more and more codified. Uh, and uh, that was a uh, that was truly profound. One of the characteristics, if you look at um, African Americans in the 19th century, in the 20th century, because of the rhetoric of this classless <coughs> democracy, there's this amazement when they go to Europe. So one example, I mean, Frederick Douglass is someone in the reading. When he flees the United States as a fugitive, and he flees because he decides to publish his first narrative, which it becomes a best-selling narrative, he publishes it because he's so effective on the speaking circuit uh, for the American Anti-Slavery Society that um, white uh, audiences increasingly um, accuse him of being a fraud, saying that he's so eloquent, he's so powerful a speaker that there's no way he could have been a slave. There's no way he could not have had any formal education. So that, that's what leads him to write his first narrative, his autobiography, where he names names. By naming names, in fact, his two owners, uh, Hugh Ald, one of his owners, and his brother, they jointly own him. Hugh Ald publicly in the newspaper said he was going to go to any lengths possible to capture Douglas. Douglas fled to England. And one of the shocks was the degree to which when he's in England, he saw it as far more democratic, far more egalitarian than any place than the, than, the United, than the United States, far more so. And the only reason why he returned was a sense of uh, responsibility and obligation to help his fellow African Americans. And so you see among um, African Americans, among the racial minorities, a movement of recognizing the United States for what it is and taking advantage of opportunities to flee and move elsewhere and settle elsewhere. And that's rarely talked about because that throws a wrench into this vision, this 
fantasy um, of a class society, of a, of a class classless society. Classless society. So now, a second characteristic of the United States, following on this idea of trying to identify the salvageable empirical residue in the idea of American exceptionalism, is that the United States is very religious. Yes. Yeah, yes. Compared yes. to all the other advanced yes. Western societies. Yes. Yeah. And that leads to, to a discussion that we intend to develop next week when we discuss the message of the American prophets. So uh, the religious experience of the American people, we can distinguish it in, in, in three great segments. Uh, so one segment are the orthodox organized forms of Christianity, both Protestant and Catholic. Then the second is the secular humanism, which to a large extent has been a kind of secularization of Christian piety, Christian moral beliefs. Huh? Uh, but the third is perhaps the distinctive and most original contribution of the American people to the religious history of humanity. And it's what Harold Bloom called the American religion. So it is uh, a form of religion developed by the new Protestant or evangelical movements like Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Latter-day Saints, which seems to be organized around a distinctive idea. The distinctive idea is that is in a sense is a radicalization of the conception that the counterpart to an anthropomorphic idea of God is a theomorphic idea of the human individual. And the human individual, the self, isn't just in communion with God or in, in some relation to God, but participates in the inner life of God. So the human, the, the individual is, in a sense, also God. Uh, and, and now, so this is the distinctive element. And this element has retained the fervor of religious faith in the United States. So one could say then, the, the United States contrasts with the relentless march of faithlessness or secularization in Europe? Or does it? Because in the United States, too, although more slowly, less radically, religious faith, organized religion, devotion, devotion has diminished. It has. Uh, uh, and Although it's still much higher than, than in Europe. In Europe. And part of the reason why most religious his scholars and historians point to that is that unlike m virtually every European nation, there's this, the separation of church and state has been a boon to American religion because it forced churches to compete for soul, so to speak, and radically adjust their message and uh, their um, their, uh, the way in which they try to attract people uh, such that uh, they, have a, they, they compete for, um, for souls, so to speak, which doesn't happen uh, or did not happen in Europe. And so it's one of the reasons why, unlike Europe, the United States is home to far more new religions um, because people borrow from a, a religion and whether it's Mormons or whether it's, uh, there are a number of, uh, of uniquely American religions that have now then become worldwide. Yeah. Now on that point though, I want to develop one more step in the argument, okay. which is that the way in which what we see developing in the United States is also what you could call 
a therapeutic idea yes, of very religion. Much so, very much so, so. A lady in Boston society asked William James whether he advised her to take up religion. William James gave an exemplary American answer. He said, I don't know. Try it out and see if you like it. This was the same William James who also said, people believe everything they can. Now, this, yeah. this allusion to William James is just by way of introducing a complication in this idea of the religiosity of the United States. That what seems to have developed on a, on a mass basis is a dilution of the dogmatic doctrinal content of religious faith. So the religion is transformed to a considerable extent into a set of metaphors or an allegory of ideas that could be restated in purely secular language. So we then have a situation in which there is, as it were, a halfway house between faith and lots of faith and a sentimental will to believe. Yes. So to go back to yes. William James' the notion, to believe. the individual wants to believe as much as he or she can, yes. but he can't believe everything. So uh, does he believe literally, fully? Uh, is it a metaphor for something else? Uh, and so this then becomes a characteristic of the culture, the consciousness yes, yes. of a supposedly religious people. Yes. Now, what, what critical attitude should we have to this sentimental will to believe? This halfway house between faith and the loss of faith. It has two great dangers, two great defects. The first is that you could see it in a form of self-deception, in which the individual de desires the consolations of religion uh, to avoid facing the truth about the human condition, about our mortality, our groundlessness, our insatiability. And then there's this appar but he dare not go all the way. He's not able to take the full leap to, to faith. The second objection is a practical, moral and political objection, that if you examine the content of the moral beliefs that emerge from this halfway house between faith and the lack of faith, to a very large extent, they seem to be a reinstatement of the moral and political piety of the faithless secular culture. So why do we need them? That is, religion, it's like art, it should be a storm that carries us in a direction in which we don't want to go. That's the real thing. But this other thing, which simply restates in sugary language something which we are inclined to believe anyway, seems to be superfluous. So that then introduces a discussion about what is the real meaning of this religiosity in the moral experience of the American people. Right. James also emphasized the um, the way in which the will to believe was a source of empowerment to the individual. Um, that, that by imposing, using one's will to believe, that empowered the individual. And there is a, a similar a parallel with a, a, an American individual wanting to believe in the, the democracy in the same way, that it empowers that individual to believe the nation is a democracy in much the same way it empowers the individual to believe that God is essentially on your side and helping you and em, em, essentially empowering you in both ways. In both ways, uh, it makes the individual feel empowered, feel comfortable. And it's also why, in the United States, those who openly repudiate those beliefs, whether politically it's communists, 
uh, or anarchists. They are the great enemy because they threaten this, this faith in the idea of democracy. And in the same way of atheists are the great, great enemy of most Americans because atheists threaten this will to believe. So now I come to a third characteristic of American exceptionalism, of the American exception. And the third characteristic has to do with the sanctity that is accorded to the basic institutional order of society, both political and economic. So I said before this idea that the American people discovered early in the history of the republic the central definitive formula of a free society. So one extreme expression of this idea is the cult of the Constitution. So <laughs> the Constitution is supposed to be a once and for all invention. It's unacceptable. Every country in the world has changed its Constitution except the United States. Napoleon Bonaparte advised that a constitution should be brief and obscure. But the only country that followed his advice was the United States. And so in the United States, the characteristic way of changing the constitution is to pretend that it means something different from what it was earlier thought to mean. And so this reinterpretation is, the, is in fact, de facto, the main form of constitutional revision in the United States. Now, this has significant, unacknowledged practical implications uh, about the kind of constitutional revision that can be implemented by this device of reinterpretation. So it's pretty easy, by argument, to pretend that the Equal Protection Clause or the Due Process Clause means something different from what they were previously thought to mean. But it's very hard to imagine that when the Constitution says there should be three branches of government, it really means that there should be five branches of government. So, so in other words, the idea that constitutional amendment has to proceed by reinterpretation rather than by frank revision has implications that push away from the change in the structure, the setup of government, toward the reinterpretation of rights. And that then has to carry the weight of the, trans of the transformation of the, of the political structure. Uh, so the cult of the Constitution, you could say, is an extreme form of this reification of the institutions, this idea that you shouldn't experiment with the institutions. Only in extreme cases under the provocation of intense national crisis will there be pressure to change the constitutional setup. And another version of the same sanctification of the institutions then applies to the idea of the market order. So then is the conception, the market order has a single natural and necessary form. So the clearest expression of this is actually not from American doctrine, but from European liberalism and neoliberalism. For example, the doctrines of Hayek, market fundamentalism. Robinson Crusoe trades on his island. If he trades long enough, he will eventually reproduce the whole system of German private law. In other words, built into the idea of the market is a particular legal and institutional architecture. It seems preposterous when stated in those forms. But that is, in fact, the fundamental belief. The market has a natural form of organization. So if I propose to you a different way of organizing a market economy, the tendency of an American will be to say, 
But that's a form of governmental intervention. So every, so the existing form of the market is considered natural, even though it's entirely a creation of politics and of law. And any alternative organization of the market is seen as a form of state intervention. It doesn't make any sense analytically, but that is, that is the expression of this belief. And so if we think that change, uh, that fundamental change in politics is structural or institutional, this is a huge incubus on American democracy. Uh, after all, the reallocation of rights and resources is like the waves of the sea that come and go. The only thing that endures in politics is the institutional legacy. And every powerful political project has to have an institutional expression. So if we then put the institutions beyond the, beyond the scope of this expression, that's a huge proviso. Now, not all American thinkers have thought this way. There has been a long line of American thinkers who tried to convince their fellow citizens to apply American experimentalism to the institutions, from Thomas Jefferson to John Dewey. For example, Tho Thomas Jefferson believed that every two and a half generations, the Constitution should be trashed, because the dead shouldn't be allowed to rule the living. But this idea is anathema to the Americans today, even though the idea was formulated by one of the revered founders. And the same attitude of John Dewey, who, who thought that the, the experimentation should be addressed in the first place to the institutions. So they failed, uh, even though this is a very important tradition in American thought. And the fundamental attitude in the United States has been the institutions are different. They're separate. They're beyond the reach of this tinkering. And it's much too dangerous to political and economic freedom to reimagine them and reshape them. And as a result, it's led to what a number of scholars have referred to as the vital center, because from the beginning there have only been two major parties. And if there's two major parties and an unwillingness to collaborate and align oneself with third parties or fourth parties, uh, there needs to be a continual um, uh, collaboration and compromise between those two parties. And dramatic or radical or quick change is hard to come by. And in fact, the only uh, periods in which there's been truly dramatic change has been when the two-party system begins to break down. Yes, but I would make this uh, qualification, John, to what, you, to what you just said. I think it's very important to distinguish the question of the distinction between structural and non-structural, institutional and non-institutional yes. change, from the question of the extremism or radicalness of change, because uh, th these are two right, different right, points. Right, that is, right. change can be institutional or structural, but still fragmentary and gradual. Yes. And in fact, most institutional change in the world, the vast majority, is fragmentary and gradual. So yes. I think we shouldn't associate, so, so the problem is not that the Americans have been uninclined to radical change, although of course they have been. Right. The problem is that the changes that they conceive are overwhelmingly not about the institutional structure, right. whether radical or not, but they're about this reallocation of rights and resources, the reinterpretation of rights and resources as in the example I gave of the Constitution. That's right. That's and this has enormous consequences for the society. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I agree. I agree with that, if you added to that. So a fourth characteristic 
in which now speaking about consciousness and related to this, the orientation of Americans to possibility. So they live in the midst of these tremendous inequalities and exclusions, but to a significant extent, they continue to believe that almost everything is possible. Uh, and so one ramification of that is experimentalism. So basic creed of democracy, it's faith in the constructive ingenuity of ordinary men and women. Large problems will yield to the cumulative effect of small practical solutions. Another manifestation is futurity, the, ad, the orientation to the fu future. We live for the future. Uh, and so there's an ambiguity about that, an ambivalence. Because we never live in the future. We always live in the present. In fact, the only thing we ever really have is life right now, the present moment. So. What does it mean to live for the future, to be always searching for something else? As Tocqueville says, the Americans were or, or are. Uh, it could be just an estrangement from reality, which is life right now, and then it would be bad. But living for the future can also mean living in the present as a being who is not determined by the present circumstances of his existence. So this is another idea of the individual. The individual, we are shaped by the social and conceptual worlds that we build and inhabit, but there's always more in us than there is in them. We spill over, we transcend. Uh, and so, that should lead us then to look for the economic and political institutions that can recognize, nurture, and develop this attribute of transcendence. It would then go against the institutional dogmatism. Yeah. So these are the, the paradoxes or the ambivalences of this, of this futurity. And what you've said, it, 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 there, I think there's a parallel with religion, um, with faith. There's in in faith, it's always or usually forward looking. It's um, one um, thinks about uh, his or her relationship with God or its equivalent in future oriented terms in the way that one, um, as Tocqueville pointed out and many others have pointed out, they are spend a lot of time imagining and hoping to realize this vision of the future in their economic lives, in their material lives, mm -hmm. in their romantic lives. Yes. Now then, a fifth characteristic of American exceptionalism, and this is perhaps the most intangible, the hardest, the hardest to describe. And it has to do with the nature of sociability in the United States. Uh, so let me introduce the idea by a remark of Schopenhauer, German philosopher, in his masterwork, The World as Will and Representation. So Schopenhauer says the situation of human beings, of humanity, he analogizes to the circumstance of a herd, a bunch of porcupines in the cold night. So the porcupines are restless. Huh? They huddle together in order to warm one another. When they huddle together, they hurt each other with their spines. Uh, they, they prick each other. And then they separate. And when they separate, they then become cold. And so they're constantly going back and forth between distance and closeness until they settle into an uncomfortable middle distance. <laughs> uh, now, 
This is the characteristic situation of sociability in the United States. So the, you could say the, the, it's, it's the sociability of the middle distance. Now let me put this in a larger historical context so you can appreciate why this is a serious social theoretical issue. In many of the societies of the past, so-called traditional societies, the characteristic formula of all social relations, of the recurrent social relations, has been the combination in the same relationships of an element of exchange, an element of power or dominion, and then the overlay on this unequal exchange of sentiment, of allegiance. So it has been what you could describe as the sentimentalizing, the sentimentalization of unequal exchange in the relations between bosses and underlings, masters and servants, men and women, parents and children. That has been the basic logic of social life, the sentimentalization of unequal exchange. So, uh, and it throws light on a remark of Talleyrand's, who said, uh, those who have not lived before the revolution do not know the sweetness of life. So what he means by the sweetness of life is this sugarcoating of the relations of unequal exchange, which were oppressive, but provided some element of warmth. Then these relations of unequal exchange are broken up, and they're allocated to different spheres of social life. So exchange is for the market. Power is for politics. Allegiance, affect, is for the family, for domestic and private life. And the result of this decomposition of the unity of the sentimentalization of unequal exchange is that as we become free, we also become cold. And this is then the key to an understanding of these conceptions in classical social theory, like Max Weber's idea of disenchantment, or Freud's idea of decathexis, and so forth. So there is an unresolved problem, which is a, a, a formidable problem in the moral evolution of humanity, which is how can we be free and warm at the same time? Uh, or do we have to settle for this middle distance? So writing at the beginning of the 19th century, Madame de Stael complained about the emergence of societies, modern societies, that were prodigal in associations and encounters that deprived us of solitude without affording us company. That's this world that Schopenhauer is describing of the porcupines, of the middle distance. Now, in this world, which I'm saying is the world of the Americans, not just the world of the Americans, of, of the modern societies, but the world which the United States exemplifies with special clarity, uh, the, uh, the moral attitude which is sought by the individual could be described as a cheerful, impersonal friendliness. So that then becomes the ethic of sociability in this world of the porcupines or of the middle distance, the cheerful, impersonal friendliness. Uh, and many people from other parts of the world habitually complain that this cheerful, impersonal friendliness of the Americans is rather cold. So uh, this, is, this is the problem that I've described of freedom and warmth, uh, a serious and central problem which social theory has trouble understanding huh? because it belongs to the realm of the, of the intangible. Huh? Uh, now, let me make one final remark before I ask John again for his, for his comments. So 
uh, a way of understanding the significance or the content of this problem is the implications for education. And the programs of educational reform or reform in the United States. Now, you know that the leading American ideologist of education, the most influential programmatic thinker about education in the United States was John Dewey. And John Dewey's program of progressive education has been immensely, has had immense influence on the practices of the elite American education. Yeah. Huh? The elite private schools, the, the top tier of the public school system, and so forth. John Dewey's program had two parts. Uh, so one part was to privilege analytical problem solving over dead memorization, over the encyclopedia. The second part was to privilege criticism, transformation, criticism of the established forms of, of knowledge, of the established forms of life. I think it's fair to say that in general what has happened is that the Americans got rid of the second part of John Dewey's program and kept the first part. And then the question is, what did they put in the place of the second part? And what they seem to have put in the place of the second part is a certain ideal of sociability, of how the individual should act vis-a-vis -vis his fellows, his, his classmates. And I would summarize the idea in the following way. It's the notion that the individual, the young person, should be able to cast on his fellows the spell of a certain form of charisma, a radiance. But this charisma, in order to be effective, must be uh, self-depreciating or self-denying. Uh, uh, it must be subtle. So he must cast a spell on the others, but at the same time not pretend to be magnetic or to be lordly in any way. And you could say, the combination, then, of cooperative analytical problem solving with this particular style of sociability, which is, in a way, an instance of the cheerful and personal yeah. friendliness, yeah. is the ideal of American education and is regarded as necessary to successful advancement in the professional business class. So, this is not just an empty moral speculation. It has practical consequences for our action, for our life experience. And therefore, it has to be part of the understanding and the criticism of American life. John. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, it's hard to add to that. I mean, that's a great. Uh, I mean, I, I was thinking when you were talking, there's, there's, there's a, um, regional differences, subtle differences as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, the manifestations differ if you're in, in the southern United States than if you're in New York or Boston or the essentially large cities versus mm -hmm. smaller communities in terms of uh, the how Dewey's vision uh, gets uh, inflected, I would say. I'm sure. So what should we do? Should we open it up now? Yes. In discussion? Yes. Yes. That's a great question. Um, right back. I would say that it, uh, 
it's, it starts with the um, Puritans, uh, really, that they come to Boston and they create this, they create this new world. They're very proud of it. It's nothing if not profound arrogance. Um, but they have to, they have to be humble because Calvinism the, is, is a, a faith that, uh, in which um, the the human is is fundamentally corrupt, and it's only through faith that one can control that corruption. But this 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 vision of a new society um, that the Puritans articulated um, the the kind of arrogance that, in a sense, that is betrayed is very much there early on. It it does depend. Um, on th the um, immigrants, their religious sensibility, Puritans uh, um, were, uh, and Quakers, in, uh, interestingly, Puritans and Quakers uh, theologically are almost diametrically opposite in that um, Quakers uh, believe that the inner light of God or Christ is within you and within all individuals, meaning that one can know God's will. And Puritans, a central tenet of Calvinism, is that one can never know God's will. So the most that we can hope for is uh, signs of his will. Uh, and so that, in theory, brings a certain humility to Puritans, although it doesn't necessarily play out. Um, and uh, so, uh, whereas in the South, in the Southern part of the United States, um, things it manifested very differently. Um, uh, in numerous ways, but you do see the, uh, with the Puritans, this, in retrospect, this kind of arrogance um, or this sense of um, righteousness um, that is very much there from the beginning. It's a, it's a, that's a very good question. Other comments or questions? Yes. Yeah, so for Dewey, there's uh, Dewey um, wanted to um, inhibit um, a, uh, a, 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 a highly competitive classroom environment. Um, he felt that constrained or almost repressed the flourishing of, um, uh, of original or ideas that can be shared. So he, he felt that the educational, the ideal educational experience was one that was really less competitive and more cooperative. Um, and it inspired everyone to develop new ideas and to not say, you know, to withhold the notion that one is better or worse than the other and to avoid this hyper-competitive classroom environment. If that answers your question. Uh, other, yes. When you talk about the idea of sociability, you spoke about charismatic. Yeah, could you speak her louder? Oh, yeah. That that what? Applies to what? Applies to students of color also? Or do you think that's something schools will encourage among white students? It's a great question. Uh, it does not apply to as much to students of uh, color, in part because, um, because of the profound racism in the United States. So. In a sense, Dewey's vision of the classroom 
Dewey doesn't really engage race in the classroom. Well, it depends on the individual, right? It depends on the individual, yeah. But if someone like Frederick Douglass was always into, was profoundly aware of his relationship in a room. Um, he, do, he knew, and this was true of, you know, essentially every African American as in the 19th century activist, male and female, the first thing that they were aware of, became aware of, is the makeup, the racial and ethnic makeup of the people in the room and how that would um, shape the discourse. So it's a very good point. The, um, Dewey was, in a sense, blind to that. I mean, it's partly of his upbringing and where he was from, but there's a huge difference between Dewey and Douglas, for example. I mean, and Douglas was obsessed with it. Douglas would, he tried to, he wanted to know before he spoke, before, and he was, he was seen as one, probably the greatest orator during the golden age of oratory. And based on terms, he could command a higher speaking fee than anybody else. Um, and he always went to the venue beforehand to make sure he wanted to know what it looked like. He wanted to know as much as he could about who would attend, um, wh what kind of people would attend, so he would have a sense of his audience. He was obsessed with that. I mean, Dewey was in a circle where um, his audience, his classroom, um, did not have the diversity that someone like Douglas had. It's a very good point. Yes, question. but, but the, 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 the remarks about what, <clears throat> what the Americans put in the, in the place of the second part of Dewey's program is, is not to be attributed to Dewey, of course. Right, this right. is me speaking, and so I'm claiming that they put this in, in the, this idea of self-effacing charisma uh, uh, and of course this is linked to a, a, a highly controversial theme in our argument which is the relation between race and class right. so what has prevailed recently in the United States or prevailed for a long time has been a certain view that the problem of racial oppression should be treated as separate and anterior to the problem of social or economic oppression of the class structure of society. It's a threshold issue that should be dealt with separately and previously. One of the practical implications of that is the development of projects like affirmative action, which have had as their major consequence, for better or worse, the development of a black colored professional and business class, separated from the rank and file of the business class. So someone like me is going to criticize that and say, this is a project that generates benefits in inverse proportion for the need for them. So the group that benefits most is the professional and business class, somewhat less the organized working class like public employees, firemen, policemen, and least of all the people who really need the help who are the mass of underclass workers in the unstable part of the labor market. Now then, among those professional and business class, people at Harvard Law School or Yale Law School, do you find some of these magnetic, self-effacing people among the students of color? You bet you do. We see them all around us. Uh, so that's my answer to your question. Others, other comments, questions, yes. Uh, 
So, but it seems to me you're describing the overtly counter-majoritarian elements in the American Constitution, huh? uh, of which there are several. Huh? So uh, that's an extreme case. Huh? And uh, so you could generalize and say what the Americans established in their Constitution was a kind of proto-democratic liberalism. Huh? Uh, and this proto-democratic liberalism can coexist with the reality of class society. So the extreme forms, some of the extreme forms have already been superseded. The property qualifications on the suffrage, which existed before, uh, and other forms are vestiges of this proto-democratic liberalism which is still in the architecture of the Constitution. Now, then there's a practical problem for the American progressive in designing their constitutional project. So you could say there are three sets of changes that you could imagine. There would be changes in the setup of the government, like the doctrine of separation of powers and so forth. Then there would be changes that have to do with the organization of politics, of democratic politics, and the relation to media and to money. And the third set of changes has to do with the federal system and the reinvention of federalism so that it actually expresses the idea which is supposed to represent that the states are supposed to be laboratories of experimentation. So, the predominant, everyone agrees that the first set of changes is beyond reach because of this sacrosanct attitude to the setup of the Constitution. Despite these exceptions, like as you mentioned, of the Electoral College and so forth. Uh, but the predominant uh, preference of the American progressives has then been to focus on the second set of changes money and media and politics and so forth. Personally, I think that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. That what they should be focusing on first is the reinvention of federalism because it has very broad appeal in the United States. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it cuts across the divisions between right and left. And it has an, an immense potential fecundity. So few, few problems are, are more significant in the United States today than the question, for example, was why isn't there a knowledge economy in North Dakota? Why is there a, North, a knowledge economy in Silicon Valley in San Francisco but not in North Dakota? In order to develop the institutional initiatives and the policies that would be hospitable to the deepening and dissemination of the advanced form of production, you would have to change American federalism to make it more capable of generating these alternative forms. That's an example. And it's also an example that suggests that it's a mistake to associate this idea of structural change with extremism or radical change? Not necessarily at all. The question is the distinctive content. Is it institutional and structural, or is it merely reallocation and reinterpretation of rights and resources? Which in politics is always more superficial. Yes. Yes. a lot, you know, relatively speaking, on history by being able to like turn the discussion towards 
right? You can build out all these playgrounds and that can be to some degree where it's for, for sales and it can be an extreme form of marginalization. But how do you imagine that we're going to complete our ourselves by focusing only the piece of like the infrastructure and that space and talking about structure? How do you think it's actually limited the possibilities as you kind of laid out for how the country should transform and understanding the actual polarization and how difficult it is to actually build a consensus in a country like America as it is today? How do you imagine it can actually well, I, 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 I think you have to be careful and, and, and uh, uh, understand. And so the, the, the implication of my remarks is not fatalistic. That is, what I'm saying is that one form of change has greater potential for fecundity than another. But you have to look at what has actually happened. So for example, so. In, in the tripartite organization of government, legislative, executive, judicial, there's no space for a form of change that is structural but localized. Because the legislature deals with general norms, the, administration, the administrative apparatus deals with particular features, but no part of this tripartite state is organized and equipped and legitimated to deal with particular localized organizations that are offensive to the ideals attributed to the law. So I'm going to give you an example of a prison system or a set of mental hospitals uh, that are, uh, impose a form of subjugation from which part of the population cannot escape by the forms of collective political and economic action that are available to them. So what has happened, in fact, in the United States? So during a certain recent historical period, the federal judiciary, occupied in large part by progressives, took this over and develop the remedy of structural injunction. So they would intervene in a school system or in a prison system or in a set of insane asylums uh, because they, they, they understood that those particular localized organizations were imposing a form of oppression from which their victims were unable to escape. So no part of the existing organization of the state was appropriate to do that. So what happened? What happened is that the federal judges took over that task uh, because they wanted to and because they could politically. Uh, and they began to intervene in a form of structural change which was localized but reached into the causal background of part of social life. Now, why did they focus on relatively peripheral parts of social life, like these, school systems, insane asylums, prisons? Why not go after the big things, uh, like the banking structure, for example, of the country, where the financial elite sits? Because they wouldn't be allowed to. That was a de facto limitation. So they went as far as they could before they ran out of power. So that shows that it is possible for structural change to emerge in surprising, contradictory, and unexpected ways. Now, then there's a larger picture. The larger picture is that in that period of American history, the late 20th century, the progressives despaired of getting from the people what they thought they could get from the courts. So they used judicial politics as a way of circumventing political politics. And that, of course, is an operation which cannot work in the long term, because in the long term, the empire will strike back. And there's no way of circumventing politics. So if you want to prevail in your society, you have to prevail in the central political institutions. So this end run by the, by the progressive judges could only have a temporary effect. 
So that's not to say they shouldn't have done it. That's just to be realistic about the limitations of this operation. So that's an example of how I would begin the discussion. And that, that you then have to decompose the problem into its elements and be realistic about the possibilities of each of the instruments. So if the structural injunctions had persisted in that direction, you would say, eventually, you would want to create a new branch of government, equipped, resource, legitimated, to do this work of intervention in parts of social life that are localized, but that require a structural change. Uh, and then they would have to be elected or chosen by the elected representatives, by the presidency and the, and the Congress. It would be a significant structural change. So, you, so, so it's always the case that a transformative project exists before the appropriate agent exists. The world is organized to reproduce itself. And every country is organized to reproduce itself. So if you want some transformation, and you look around to see who is the agent equipped to do, a, to do that, or legitimated to do that, the agent never exists. So who is the agent? The agent is whoever wants to be the agent and can get away with it for a certain while, until at the second stage, you create a more appropriate agent. That's the nature of transformation. That's real life. Uh, and that's how I, would, how I would begin to think about this problem. There are other hands. Private sovereignty? I didn't understand what, what, what you mean. Tribal. Tribal. Tribal, yeah. oh. <laughs> and the, United, the United States made it very clear early on that they did not want uh, tribes being part of the nation. They saw it as, you know, so they essentially treated them, I mean, legally as dependent um, nations, and then they would took over their land. It, it was the, they were essentially the they were um, less the enemy, but just a a, uh, a a problem to to deal with. They saw they saw um, they saw the tribes who were had been there for a long time. They denied their their legitimacy. Um, it's and and it was important for politicians and for government officials and for Americans to uh, to deny um, the 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 flagrant um, abuse um, to retain their their myth of being a democracy and of being a uh, a benevolent nation I mean it was it was it was horrible it was shocking but so they they made up they made up stories um, uh, and they had um, the this manifest destiny was I mean that was almost a code word for ignoring the rights of uh, of, of tribes so there's, there, there's one development of our argument here that I'd, I'd like to try out, if I could, John, uh, which is the relation between American exceptionalism and American nationalism, and the, uh, the sense in which the United States is, is a nation. Uh, and I think we have to put that in the context of a more general idea of the evolution of nations 
of the national difference in the world. So the nations in the world used to be like tribes, like families, yes. a family of families, by some quasi-biological principle of succession. And what it meant to be a member of a certain nation is that you lived according to the ancient customs of your people. So, for example, to be a Roman, uh, an ancient Roman, was to live according to the immemorial customs of the Romans. That's what it meant. Now the nations of the world are... But only if you're a free Roman. If, if you're, you're a free <laughs> Roman, of course. If you were uh, an enslaved Roman, uh, if you were a prisoner of war, then it was very yeah. different. Well, if you were enslaved Roman, you weren't really a Roman, but that's another <laughs> discussion. Uh, so you, now, now the nations of the world are uh, in a, in, in, in changing their character. So the, the, the national difference is becoming a kind of moral specialization within humanity. So, Humanity develops its powers and possibilities only by developing them in different directions. Uh, there is not as a self-evident form of social life. So we develop by experimenting. And the nations are then these experiments. And now, in, and the United States is a country that was created already at a relatively advanced moment in this transformation that I've described. This has led some people to a misunderstanding of the character of American nationalism. The idea that the United States is somehow a creedal nation, that it's based on doctrines, on abstractions. No nation can be based on abstractions. So we have to have a different sense of the national difference. Now, in this process of movement from being tribes based on quasi-biological similarity and cohesion of customs to being moral experiments, an accident happens. And to illustrate the nature of this accident, let me take the example of the Meiji Restoration in Japan in the middle of the 19th century. The nations of the world, in order to prosper, to survive, to be powerful, have to eviscerate part of their customs and imitate the institutions and practices of other countries, as the Japanese did. So they go to the altar of worldwide rivalry and they tear out part of their customary collective identity and combine the part that they keep with a part that they imitate or import from somewhere else. Uh, and as a result of that, the, the nations become more alike uh, because there, there's this process of reciprocal imitation, huh? which is not recognized by the idea of American exceptionalism, but is what exists. And so then the following situation happens. This is the peculiarly poisonous character of contemporary nationalism. Two nations live side by side, and they come to hate each other. Not because they're different, but because they're becoming alike, and because they want to be different. Uh, and so it's the impotent will to difference, which is the rage to be different to affirm identity, sovereignty, power, separation, in the presence of the waning of actual difference. Now, what should the attitude to this be? What should our attitude be? So the attitude of reactionary right-wing populism is return to the ancient differences, reestablish what we were. And the attitude of liberal cosmopolitanism is suppress difference. We should converge to the same set of institutions and practices worldwide. The third option is equip difference. Allow the nations of the world to become more different. And the differences that matter most are not the ones that we have inherited. They're the ones that we invent. Uh, and 
Prophecy is more important than memory, although memory provides the materials for prophecy. So we should therefore equip the nations of the world with the institutional instruments by which they can become more different. Uh, and, uh, the, and real difference, unlike the will to difference, because it is tangible and porous, is also susceptible to compromise. Whereas the intransigent will to difference cannot be compromised because it has no content. So, and I think that then suggests an attitude to the problem of nationalism. That nationalism should be made fertile as an instrument for the creation of new differences within humanity so that there can be these experiments. And that would then be also the basis for an attitude to American nationalism. And we could interpret then American exceptionalism as a distorted form of this nationalist idea. Yes. Our, our ideology of? Welfare and other social programs. I th isn't the premise of, of welfare that it, it is a class society? I don't understand. Right, so that's why I'm saying how we have faith in this narrative that America is a class program. Like that is, I mean, it's actually not a class. So I think the one way to reconcile the idea of classlessness with the idea of welfare assistance is the notion that the individual has had bad luck. Uh, and for whatever reason, he's fallen into illness. He's become deprived of assistance. So we assist him individually without having a structural idea. Uh, but I think that your question leads us to the issue to a very important aspect of the discussion about why institutional change has primacy over non-institutional change. So the basic idea of social liberalism or social democracy in the West since the middle of the 20th century has been a market order has a natural content and the market is a tremendous device for the creation of wealth, unfortunately, a market generates inequalities. So we come after the fact and we correct these inequalities through redistributive social spending and redistributive social entitlements and progressive taxation. So in other words, retrospective and compensatory redistribution humanizes the market order. Now, the problem is that it, this humanization is never adequate. If the inequalities are massive, they cannot be corrected adequately by retrospective and compensatory redistribution. If the production system is hierarchically segmented and there is an abyss between the advanced and the backward parts of production, as there is now in the United States, the resulting inequalities will be massive. If we attempt to correct these inequalities after the fact, through progressive taxation, entitlements, and redistributive social spending, the, the, the retrospective redistribution would have to be massive. And long before it reached the dimension that enabled it to compensate for the inequalities, it would begin to derange the established economic arrangements and incentives. An exact and unacceptable cost in loss in the, of productivity, of the creation of wealth, of economic turmoil and confusion. So, 
Social spending is indispensable for the purpose of investing in people and in their capabilities. But it's not an adequate solution to the problem of inequality. The only adequate solution to the problem of inequality is changing the arrangements, the economic and political arrangements, that determine the primary distribution of wealth and income, not the derivative distribution that results from the retrospective compensatory activity of the state. That's then a completely different agenda. Because then when we want, what we want is to reorganize the market order, for example, so that it democratizes the access to productive resources and opportunities, rather than to engage in this activity of the compensatory retrospective redistribution. That's a completely different agenda. And it's for that reason that it becomes fundamental to stock the mind with ideas about alternative institutional arrangements. Because that's the only way to change the primary distribution, which is what matters. Yes. Yeah. I think that for, for our purposes of our discussion, the crucial issue is that should we allow the Americans, us, you, to accord to their institutions an exemption from the reach of the experimentalist impulse, which is otherwise so alive in their culture. So the idea of the American in the United States is you tinker with everything. But now comes the exception. The exception is, but don't tinker with the institutions. But actually, it turns out that the most important thing to tinker with are the institutions. So that's the subject that's in discussion. Yeah. Are the Americans justified in according to their institutions this exemption from the reach of the experimentalist impulse? That was the subject of debate between Thomas Jefferson and John Dewey and everyone else yeah. in the United States. Well, I yeah. think that the uh, that our idea is to have a discussion between the two of us and then with you. Uh, yes. And uh, I think the subject is inherently perplexing and difficult. And I th the 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 impulse that controls here is this attempt to imagine alternative futures for the country, and that impulse informs then the reinterpretation of the present and the past. To me, that's, that, that's, what, that's what matters. Otherwise, we have a kind of mystification, right? And this is what a large part of social science and policy discourse does. Right. It imposes on the reality a halo of uh, a mendacious semblance of naturalness and necessity. And then this is continued in the kind of Whiggish, progressive line of American historiography, which sees everything leading up to civil rights and affirmative action and so forth. It's not what thought should be. 
I mean, the reason to think ab about things is to subvert these these conventions and extend. We we deepen our insight into the actual by extending our imagination of the possible. If we don't have an imagination of possibility, we don't understand anything. And so that's that's the basic premise of the discussion. Yes. So thinking broadly about inequalities, kind of in the history, you've had this march towards kind of eliminating inequality. One of those kind of structures is either you have, but in anything we imagine, it's always been our construction of inequality seems to be kind of an inherent part of being of the human condition. And so thinking about that, is there a system you envision that would completely eliminate the pure ways of inequality, or are there steps that we can take right now, or steps that we should be taking? That system that goes that rids of these inequalities. But it's not it's not an, an all or nothing, right? There, there's always going to be inequality of one kind or another. But then there's the question of is the class character of society a permanent attribute of society and of and of democracy? On its face, it contradicts the promises of democracy. So is it susceptible to change in the structure of political and economic institutions? That's the question that's presented to us. Right. Yes. Do you have any ideas about section time? Can you speak up a little bit? Do you have any idea about sections, like how you can operate for that? That's usually dealt with in the second week of yeah. the course, right? So. The teaching assistant will communicate with the undergraduates in the course uh, and discuss uh, a mutually agreeable time. Right. And beginning next week, you can, I would at least like to see some of the readings be part of the discussion. We've tried to make an effort to assign readings that relate to the discussion of the week, um, which can bring in some. And, I've, and there's one other thing to mention, which is the classes will be videotaped, yes. and the videotape will be placed on the course website a few days after each class. Uh, that, of course, entails the risk that some people will f feel less need to come to class, which would be very unfortunate. But I think that's the price worth paying yeah. for, 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 for being able to go over our discussions. And, and think about them. Yeah. Um, I saw that next week we have to read the Padres from Panamka from Benito Torino for class. Does that include the Billy Budd also in the book? No, it's just Benito Torino. Uh, so it's only 30 some pages. It's a short um, novella, which um, Melville published. I th is that next week or is it the uh, following week? Yeah, I think next week is the first week of readings of Douglas and, yeah, um, yeah. the American prophets, the American, the uh, message prophets. of the American yeah. prophets. Yeah, Benito Serino. So the the um, Benito Serino. So I, I tried to we tried to order or uh, um, have texts that were comparatively cheap. So the Benito Serino. It, I think it's one dollar. Uh, it's very cheap. It doesn't have notes, but it has both. It's it's actually Benito Serino um, and Billy Budd. But you only need to. I mean, Billy Budd is a brilliant um, uh, novella in itself. But uh, Benito Serino is what the reading is. Yes. No, no, it's not a free choice. It's, it'll be an engagement with some central aspect of the argument of the course. Yeah. But we'll describe it immediately after the spring recess. Yeah. It's not a research paper. All the writing requirements in the course, the brief essays during the semester, the final paper, are thought papers. They're engagements with the argument. That's what we have, what we intend here essentially is an argument. 
and we want engagement with it. Good. So I think we're set. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, how are you? I'm good. Good. So I brought, if you could do it, I brought um, the additional readings. To, um, if you could make, um, if you could upload them on the website. So I have, um, and you can, um, and if you can do that, I, they're in my office. If you want to just go back, come back to my office. Okay, yeah, you can do that. Um, I have, a number of them are already up there. So, um, Was your father a law student when he took it? Okay.